Part 6 in the commentary reaction, Superhuman in the Octagon and Perfect in the Courtroom, Assessing the Culpability of Martial Artists Who Killed During Street Fights, by Stephen Michael Ian Coonan. This is over on the law.emory.edu website. They're talking about uh, the elements of self-defense and use of force. The objective element requires a defender to have reasonable, reasonably believed that he needed to apply that he needed to apply the level of force used. Hence, a defender's belief in the need to use force must be not only sincere but also reasonable. A reasonable belief does not require factual correctness. A party only needs a reasonable perception that an attacker threatened imminent deadly force against him to meet the objective belief standard. This is true regardless of whether the attacker's intended use or actually used deadly force. This is true regardless of whether the attacker intended to use or actually used deadly force against the defender. The attacking and reasonable and responsive elements together compromise, I mean, comprise perfect self-defense. Okay? So in other words, if they believe that they were going to be harmed, that's going to be enough, legally speaking. Legally speaking, that's supposed to be enough. That's supposed to be fine. Now, we know that in reality, that's probably not going to pan out that way. But that's what's supposed to happen. Again, based on who you are as attacker and who you are as defender, I think juries are going to throw that specific, deliberate, blatant part of the law out of the window. Beyond the full protection afforded by perfect self-defense, some states recognize two partial defenses to intentional homicide. The partial defenses are imperfect self-defense and the provocation defense. So now we're going to get into that. Hopefully this won't be too long. <clears throat> B, partial defense one, imperfect self-defense. Some jurisdictions allow the use of imperfect self-defense doctrine, doctrine to mitigate culpability, which I think means guilt for what otherwise appears to be an intentional homicide. It applies when the defender honestly but unreasonably believed that he needed to use deadly force to defend himself from an imminent attack and, and killed his attacker as a result. So I thought I was gonna die bad. That's it, right? Even though when you look at it in hindsight, you weren't gonna die, but I thought I was gonna die. I think an example might be if somebody jumps out with the Jason Holly mask on with a knife up and goes, ah, and next time they want to stab somebody and then the person hits him in the throat and kills him. I think that might qualify, but then again, I'm not an attorney, so I don't know. If I was on a jury, I wouldn't convict for that. Imperfect self-defense is, is a peculiar doctrine according to some courts because, quote, outside of homicide law, the concept of imperfect self-defense doesn't exist. With respect to all the crimes, the defendant is either guilty or not guilty. There is no in-between, end quote. In contract, the MPC recognizes imperfect self-defense as a mistake of fact. Under the MPC, a court cannot convict a person of an intentional, intentional killing if he mistakenly concludes by either recklessness or negligence that the use of deadly force is necessary. But such recklessness or negligence in assessing the situation may establish culpability for an unintentional homicide. Imperfect self-defense differs from perfect self-defense in its effect on the defendant. A defendant is completely exonerated when acting in perfect self-defense because he committed an action that the law regards as justifiable. In contrast, a defendant acting in imperfect self-defense is not justified, but only less culpable than one who commits an intentional homicide. Imperfect self-defense is a common law rule of mitigation that reduces a murder conviction to manslaughter on the premise of an absence of malice. I think that may mean, you know, we realize you didn't mean to do it, so it won't be murder, it would just be manslaughter, which I guess means you may get out sometime, but just not within a year or two. But again, you need to consult a lawyer with this, and we martial artists, we need to review this so that we can get some kind of handle on how the legal system and the public are going to end up seeing our abilities if we ever have to use them to defend ourselves. So, this next part is partial self-defense 2. 
provocation. Similar to imperfect self-defense, the provocation defense is an, is an intermediate category of culpability, which I think means guilt, recognizing that a defender who kills his provoker should not be guilty of murder, but should be guilty of some crime. The result is a conviction for voluntary manslaughter. Yeah, I was just hitting it bad. The provocation defense recognizes that if sufficiently provoked, even a reasonable, reasonable man can lose the self-control that would normally prevent him from killing. Like in perfect self-defense, a provocation claim is only partial, not a complete defense. This section explains common law provocation by examining the, provo the provocation elements in the subsection one and the cooling off elements in subsection two. Subsection three examines the MPC version of provocation and subsection four explores the reasoning behind the defense's origin. All right, we're going to stop here and pick up with these particular subsections in a minute.